Hi, it's uh, Matt Moore here from Columbia University today. Uh, pleasure to speak to you briefly about uh, cardiac amyloidosis and some quick tips on routine medical management. Most patients with uh, cardiac amyloid have significant heart failure symptoms, and the key to management is the volume control. While Lasix is the first-line diuretic, we found that um, more bioavailable loop diuretics, including bumetanide and torsamide, especially in combination with the mineralocorticoid antagonists, are um, quite effective at um, maintaining volume status in these patients. And there is really no guideline-based recommendations for the uh, use of renin-angiotensin-aldosterone um, antagonists and, importantly, a beta blockade in these patients. Um, arrhythmias, particularly atrial fibrillation, are quite common in patients with um, uh, cardiac amyloidosis, and they're associated with a high rate of intracardiac thrombi. So as we'll highlight, um, anticoagulation is particularly key, and many of these patients actually present with atrial fibrillation and a uh, surprisingly controlled ventricular response due to the concomitant uh, damage, if you will, of the amyloid to the conduction system, and so rate control is um, often easy to achieve. In many patients over time, uh, because of the progressive conduction disease, a permanent pacing is often needed, especially in transthyroid and cardiac amyloidosis. And um, uh, we've actually found that potentially biventricular pacing, uh, maintaining ventricular synchrony because they're pacemaker dependent, may be useful. Um, there's really uh, very little role for defibrillators, especially um, in primary prevention, as they haven't been shown to be associated in cardiac amyloidosis with an improvement in survival. And for selected patients who have isolated uh, cardiac involvement um, with a transthyridin or AL amyloid, heart transplant has been performed at expert centers um, with uh, outcomes that are similar to patients with um, non-amyloid indications. So um, again, a few uh, highlights. Um, as we know, cardiac amyloid is a quintessential form of diastolic heart failure as shown here. Uh, the ventricular chamber capacity is very, very small. They're enlarged atrium, and over time, patients develop, as shown in these pressure volume loops, uh, progressive diastolic dysfunction with upward shifts in the end diastolic pressure volume relationship. Therefore, there are concomitant declines in the end diastolic volume and stroke volume. And if stroke volume declines, so does cardiac output, and hence, so does blood pressure. And so these patients often are intolerant of um, standard medical therapy because of the declines in stroke volume, cardiac out, and blood pressure, and there's an essential role in these patients for removal of neurohormonal antagonists, that is beta blockers, ACE, ARBs, and RNA therapy. As I also mentioned, atrial fibrillation is very common in cardiac amyloidosis. In large series, at least a third of patients have been described of having prevalent atrial fibrillation. In the ATTR-ACT trial that studied tefaminus, it was more than half. And over the lifetime of an amyloid patient, at least in our center, we've seen almost 90% of them develop atrial fibrillation. So as I note here, it's nearly universal over time. And the key here is that these patients have a high rate of a thrombosis um, and uh, embolism. And so anticoagulation, irrespective of the CHADS VAS score, is um, uh, indicated. In general, um, the event rates as shown here, uh, at least at our center in patients on NOACs versus warfarin are quite similar and did not statistically differ. And so we've been increasingly using uh, uh, NOACs in this particular patient population. Thanks for your time uh, in learning a little bit more about the medical management of patients with uh, cardiac amyloidosis.